Well, welcome to the Transform My Dance Studio podcast, the only podcast for dance studio owners, where each week we bring you business growth strategies to help you increase your profits, impact the lives of more students, while ensuring you give back some time to have a little life outside of the studio. It's time for you to become the go-to studio in your area. Now, here's your host, founder of the Dance Studio Owners Association, Clint Salter. Hey, it's Clean, and before we get started, I wanted to tell you about a brand new guide that we've put together for you, Nine Simple Secrets to Creating the Perfect Studio Handbooks That Save You Hours. Now, this must-have guide is going to teach you how to drastically reduce the amount of questions you receive from parents, students, and teachers, which means you're going to get back hours every single day. In this free guide, I'm going to teach you the three must-have handbooks that you need in your studio that are going to save you hours per day. I'm also going to share with you what 93% of studio owners forget to include on the first page of their handbooks that dramatically increases the number of people that read your handbooks And I'm going to dive into the exact language you should use in your handbooks that gets your studio families paying closer attention. Wouldn't it be great not to receive that, you know, text message at like 10 p.m. at night? Well, that's what I'm giving you in this brand new free guide, Nine Simple Secrets to Creating the Perfect Studio Handbooks that Save You Hours. All you need to do is text the number 44222. Uh, with the word handbook guide. So text the number 44222 uh, and the word handbook guide, all one word. Now, if you're outside of the USA, you can easily go to our website, dancestudioownersassociation.com forward slash free guide. Okay, dancestudioownersassociation.com forward slash free guide to get access to our brand new guide. Now, let's get on with the show. Hey there, Dan Studio owners. Welcome to the Transform My Dan Studio podcast. It's Clint here, and I'm so thrilled that you're joining us for today's episode. Now, today's guest is the one and only Misty Lown. Now, Misty founded her first business, Misty's Dance Unlimited, at the age of 20. One. And since that time, she's founded several more companies, including the Dance Studio Mentoring Enterprise, More Than Just Great Dancing. Misty has encouraged and inspired thousands of entrepreneurs and young women in the past 15 years and continues to share her positive perspective on business and life through her writing, speaking, and mentoring. The other thing is like Misty is just like a super nice person and so generous and so passionate and uh, I met Missy a couple of years ago now. We were both speaking at a conference in Queensland and I just fell in love with her. So Missy, I'm so glad that you've taken some time out to speak with our studio owners today. Well, Clint, it's an honor to be here and uh, welcome to the United States. Yes, everyone who's listening, I'm now living in New York. So uh, I am on your side and super excited about that. So Missy, let's talk firstly about, about your dance studio. You started it at 21. You just told me you're coming up to your 20th year yeah. anniversary. I'm sorry, I've just realized I've given away your age as well, <laughs> uh, which is a huge, a huge accomplishment. You know, in those early days, you know, what was it like, you know, starting a business at, at 21? And what did you, like, what did you know that you had on your side to make the studio successful? Oh, wow. Well, those first years were beautiful and brutal in a lot of ways. So I look back at them and uh, I call it brutal. It was just a combination of those two things together. And I think like most entrepreneurs, I just had a vision of what it could be. And mm. I could see that in bright, vivid colors. And I had just enough confidence it might work out that I took the leap. And I just really want to give a shout out to my parents because I really can look back and remember sitting at the kitchen table and my parents who were divorced at the time came together for the purpose of sitting with me in encouraging me to take this leap. And my dad offered that if I needed a loan, he would go co-sign it at the bank with me. And they really didn't have the resources to do that, but he stepped up to say he would anyway. And fortunately, I never needed to take him up on that offer, but just that confidence that he had in me to say, I would sign what I've earned and what I have on the line so that you can build what you know uh, you have inside of you, that was a a true gift to me. 
and that that got me going. But boy, once you get into it, it's not the it's not the bright, <laughs> shiny sunrise on the horizon or that you think you're chasing uh, after. It's a, it's a in the trenches experience. And uh, Clint, I remember going at seven a.m. <clears throat> excuse me, and I would take my breakfast, my lunch, my dinner. I'd work all day on the business side of things, and then what truly was you know so called the eleventh hour of the day, where you're just at the end of the end. Then the children showed up, and it was time. <laughs> It was time to be on. And at the end of that night, I would do the cleaning and wrap everything up and head home maybe at 11 to catch a few hours of sleep and start over the next day. And uh, although I wouldn't want to go through those years again, I can tell you that the character developed in me was priceless. Uh, I, I, I can only I can only imagine. Is there anything that you'd look back on, let's say those first three years, and I'm not about regrets, but is there anything that you think, I wish I did that differently? Absolutely. I wish I would have hired help earlier. I wish I would have understood mm-hmm. that I didn't have to be all things to all people. Now, if you can just kind of reel back into the mind of a 21-year-old, I was still just a student myself, a dancer myself, and I thought... I had to you know, be the best ballet teacher and jazz teacher and tap teacher and hip hop teacher. And let me tell you, I don't have a hip hop bone in my body. <laughs> I mean, I, I am a, you know, um, classic, not hip hop dancer. I am a ballet dancer, but I had felt this pressure that I had to be cool and great at everything. And I think if I would have realized the power of staying in your lane and playing to your strengths earlier, I would have saved myself some unnecessary uh, late nights trying to figure out. Um, <laughs> Gotta be a hip hop dancer. I'm sorry, I gotta be that way. You know, it just wasn't going to be great anyway. So, of course, that we can joke on the dance side because everybody can appreciate that. But it plays out on the business side too. I mean, there was no reason that I I should have been the one um, doing the newsletter and making the bank deposit and returning the messages. And I mean, sure, there's a certain. Um, grit required just to get up and get going. And I, I learned a lot by playing all those roles, but I will tell you, I played all of those roles for too long. Mm. And that's a common thing. You, you would see it with your studio owners and I see it a lot with ours as well. But what do you say to those people that, that say, well, I don't have money to hire someone or I, I don't think now's the right time to hire that first office manager or admin assistant? I say uh, something that my mentor, Darren Hardy, told me, and that is that great people are free. So if you find a great person, they're going to pay for themselves and provide you the time and space to get back into your zone. Because whatever your zone or your lane is, your unique gift and talent, that's worth more to the organization than trying to do everything for the organization. Uh, I love that. Great people are free. And I'm writing that down because I think that's a great line from the awesome Darren. Uh, what does it take though to bring in great people? Because that's that's the trick, isn't it? So often I see it with studio owners. They, they say, I need help. And they literally sometimes go off the street or get a dance mom in and says, okay, now just help, right? And, and that's not the way we want to do it. We don't want to be reactive in our hires. Um, so what process, you know, do you go through now after, you know, t- 20 years of learning in the studio? How do you go about hiring the, the right people? Well, everything I've learned, I've learned the hard way. I wish I could say that I came on, you know, this was just natural knowledge for me. But unfortunately, I think I'm an experiential learner. And um, so I've learned by hiring in a reactive sense. I remember one time, Clint, we got to April, the time of year we are in now, and it was just weeks before recital, and I was in over my head, and I just needed help with bookkeeping. So I found a um, you know a bookkeeper, and I did it really fast, like. She answered the ad. It seemed okay. (laughs) Just like, can you start tomorrow? You know, and when she, super, super sweet gal, I really enjoyed her uh, personally. But when she showed up with a QuickBooks for Dummies book on her first day of work, I I knew that I probably hadn't done due diligence or taken my time to make the right hire. And it's a hire that only lasted for a few months. And when I look back at the times when I have been, have learned from that and been proactive instead of reactive and really spent the time to craft a thoughtful ad to really spell out and understand the needs of the studio for that season and uh, get other people involved in the hiring process to expand my own view. See, 
see, Clint, as a as an artist and an entrepreneur, I'm wired to find similarities with people. Mm. So it, it can be an Achilles heel for me. You'll put me in an interview and I'm going to naturally gravitate towards finding what's similar about that person and myself. Mm. And then I can anchor on that to the exclusion of really finding out whether or not the right fit. So I have to bring people in around me that will kind of stand in the gap of that. It's not a weakness that I... I like to find the commonality between people, um, but it's not necessarily a best hiring practice. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs are, we're wired to please, we're wired to create, we're wired to find out how things can work. And the interview process should be designed to find out the opposite. Let's find out all the reasons why this person wouldn't work. <laughs> Let's find out the things that might be problems with that. So I- I've learned to bring people around me to lengthen the hiring process, to multiply the number of interviews, and also to put them through hoops. The first interview is always going to be over the phone. My gosh, if, if they can't sparkle on the phone, I, I don't want them talking to my to my family is representing my brand. Then we're going to have some sort of a task associated with, I want to see how well they write, how well they follow directions. And then they're going to come in for an in-person interview. And by the way, those first three hoops are not with me because I will absolutely mess that up trying to (laughs) be friends with that person over the phone because that's how I'm wired and I know that. So I'm not never going to meet with that person until they've been cleared through a few hoops mm-hmm. by my team. And if the team thinks they're a good prospect, then they'll finally uh, allow me to have that conversation. <laughs> and be friends with them. That's right. Uh, I, I think that's really good. And you touched on a really great point um, and, and something that's really relevant actually for us in uh, we recently, well, I recently hired an assistant and I reactively hired an assistant about six months ago and they lasted three days. And I was like, okay, we need to kind of go back to the drawing board here Mm -hmm. and created like a four, like a four step process similar to what you just um, spoke about. And it was one of the best things that, that we've done in terms of, in terms of hiring. And this is what our studio owners need to be thinking about when it comes to bringing, you know, giving the, the, the best opportunity for them to get the right person in that first, that first time. Absolutely. I think it's just, we're so unique as studio owners. We typically tend to come from an arts background. We typically tend to be on that creative side of the brain. And if you think of how we function in our studio owner life, I mean, we can just create things. I can wake up today and say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a new series of classes or a new summer camp or a new master class. We just we just invent things and we don't necess- it doesn't necessarily require a, a length of research or a five-step process to do what it is that we sell as dance school owners. Mm. Although, of course, we, you know, I do advise doing your homework before starting new programs, but it's not necessarily our, our first reaction to do all that homework. So we really have to dial into what's not natural for us in order to really save ourselves from ourselves, or at least that's my personal experience. Oh, yeah, completely, completely agree with you. Um, I want to shift gears uh, a second. And, and Misty, you're working with, uh, you know, hundreds of studio owners inside of your business, you know, to help them grow their business, to help them step into that CEO role inside of their business. What do you think studio owners need to be doing in, in 2017 to, to run and to grow uh, a thriving dance studio? Well, we have a theme inside of our organization this year that we're coaching all of our members through, and it's called the 1231 Studio. And that really stands for December 31st of 2017. And the idea is that on 1231, you're going to get a series of scorecards regarding your business. The the most uh, obvious is that year-end profit and loss statement. That's going to tell you for all of the time you've put in, that blood, sweat, and tears, what's the return on your investment and what are you going to be happy with what that bottom line says at the end of the year. But that's not the only scorecard. You're also going to get a scorecard when maybe on December 20th or 23rd, you're able to close the doors of your business for the holidays and walk away without regrets, without worries and spend time with your family, without worrying about whether or not uh, you had a good end to the season or if the costumes are going to show up or the show was well prepared for that. That's another type of scorecard. Mm. And then there's the one that you might not expect. And that's one, Clint, that I faced this year over our Christmas break. And I was that my son had a, a snowboarding accident. We were out skiing and snowboarding in Colorado. And he had a pretty rough accident. He flipped a couple of times and hit a sign and had a head injury. And I was pretty much 
out of my business for probably six to eight weeks, just dialing in uh, the minimum amount I could because my focus was on making sure that my son Max was able to uh, be on the best recovery path possible. He wasn't in school for a week and then it was half days and then there were doctor's appointments and evaluations and nutritional things that we had to do. And that was my number one priority. So I was so thankful that I had put in the time and effort all year long so that when it mattered, I was able to step away from the business because you just never know when something like that might happen. Mm. So the concept of a 1231 studio is making decisions today and every day that are going to support that end result that you want. And it's, um, you know, it's not a necessarily an exciting topic. I'm sure people would rather say, Misty, if you would just tell me the key to get a hundred more students, that's what I really <laughs> want. If you would just tell me how to double my bottom line or to hire people and I wouldn't have problems with them or how to work with millennials or whatever the, you know, challenge du jour is. Mm -hmm. But the reality is what studio owners need to do every day of 2017 is do the, the good and hard daily work that will support a 1231 finish that they would be proud of, whether that's financial or family-wise, um, or just making sure all systems are solid if you had to step away like I did, mm. and to know that mm. things would carry forward. That's, that's what I want for all studio owners in 2017. Yeah, I, I love this message. And this is something that we both connect on, you know, this whole continuous movement, you know, Darren, your mentor who wrote the compound effect, um, mm -hmm. that the slight edge uh, philosophy as well is, you know, doing things every single day that are going to yes. get you to that, that vision, that goal that you have in place. Mm -hmm. um, and not take and and not be distracted, which we talked about before the call. You know, with with shiny disco balls that are surrounding us all the time. That we go, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, that's a good idea. And then we kind of do half of everything. Yeah, absolutely. And if I could just um, add something to that, I I think we also need to dial in and use what we've already learned. And what I mean by this is somebody once told me that we're in danger as entrepreneurs of becoming intellectually obese. And I talk about that in my book, One Small Yes. And the idea is we're so excited to consume all the information that's at our fingertips now. When I started as a studio owner, I mean, I had to wait for that annual conference or that event and you know, drive or take a plane and take time off work. I mean, it was like an epic undertaking if I got to go get some information that could help me move my business forward. Well, today, I mean, you can get information in Facebook. It, it, the Facebook algorithm is going to make sure that you don't miss the newest product for sale to help you improve your studio. Yeah. So I, I see so many owners that are um, just consuming every quick fix solution, but they're not um, ever using what they've actually purchased or, you know, they start it for a day and then that planner gets filled out, but never implemented mm -hmm. or they try this thing or they learn this new trick and it, it's just for the moment, but they don't go the distance with it. So I think that really ties in with that 1231 philosophy is you probably already have access to everything you mm -hmm. need to yeah. move your business forward, but like go Find something that speaks to you. Find a few things in your business that need time and attention and go deep with that mm. um, instead of, you know, continually just buying the next new thing or attending the next new thing. Um, yeah. and please don't hear that I'm against uh, buying products. We both sell products. <laughs> it's That's important. right. We're, we're both up for it. But, but you I'm know. Coaching, but, but use yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, you use it and, and like you said, you know, go deep and do do deep work in those specific mm -hmm. areas that, that you want to improve. Like, you know, and the amount of times we both probably get asked this question, like you said, I just want 100 new students. Mm -hmm. um, it's the biggest question that I get. And I was like, okay, let's, we can do that. It's actually not, it's not rocket science to get 100 new students. Absolutely not, but it's rocket science to get 100 students and have the system to support them and yes. teach them and retain them and make sure they have a great onboarding experience. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's not just about getting about the students, it's about changing lives. And it's about getting the right student in there that believes in what you're actually started your studio for in the first place. So it's just a much, much deeper approach to everything. So I wish that for studio owners in 2017 that they would do the daily 
uh, grit and grind to produce a, t- a 1231 result that they would be proud of and that would support them if they needed to ever step away and that they would go deep uh, with people that they value and care about and with topics that will really move their business forward. Mm, so good. So good. With you on that, um, Misty, you just kind of touched then on, you know, onboarding and, and keeping students around. I want to get your your tips around retention because this is something I know we're both really passionate about, especially the onboarding process and then ensuring that the customer doesn't get forgotten about when they've signed the enrollment form. And because we still see that a lot. And, and I think especially in, in, in nowadays where there are so many new studios popping up all mm-hmm. of the time, we've got, to, we've got to go the extra mile now. We've got to make sure that we're providing the most incredible customer experience for the parents, for the students. What are, you, what are some of the things you're doing inside of your studio to, to really wow your customers? Well, I'd like to start with the retention side because I think that's what's on everybody's mind right now. We're mm-hmm. here in the United States cruising towards recital time and this is yeah. the time when parents are going to decide whether or not dance played an important enough role in their child's life to re-enroll for the next year. And so we're doing a couple of things this year to um, really engage our students. One is a campaign called Every Student Matters, Every Class, Every Time. And we've had this going on all year, but it's in particular, we're ramped up right now. We have 750 students that attend weekly classes and another 150 that come through our um, one-off programs like mm. uh, mom's, mom's Day Out and play dates and birthday parties. So I'm going to carve out those 150 for a moment and focus on our weekly students. So each of those 750 students will, by this time of year, have gotten a personal letter from a handwritten letter from one of their teachers. And that has had a huge impact. We've had parents tell us that, you know, the child, the small child is sleeping with this letter or it's pinned up on the board or they took to school or how much the teenager treasured the words of encouragement and affirmation because the, you know, the letters just always seem to come at the right time for the kid. We hear that a lot. Like you just couldn't believe the timing of getting that letter. I don't know if you knew what was going on, but but it was perfect. So every, every child's getting that personal communication. And I think it's important we're a large school and the larger we become, the more personal we have to be. Um, you know, we don't want to ever have anybody get the sense of feeling lost inside of a organization. We, we want it to have the sense of community, which leads to my second point. We've centered all of our communications around this idea of come for class, stay for community. So yes, we lead what we, what we offer to the community, what we sell is classes. So we lead with that. But as soon as they're inside, we're very intentional about creating community, mm. whether that's introducing parents to parents or creating opportunities for them to be involved in community events together. It really is all about making the studio that third place. So there's a philosophy. I talked about it a bit last summer at the Dance Teacher Summit, but it's about the idea that every person has a third place. So for an adult, their first place would be home, their second place would be work, and their third place might be maybe they're a part of the softball team or they're a part of a church or they're part of a book club. They're going to have something outside of work and home that provides community. It might be the gym. Students have the same thing. Their first place is home, their second place is school. You want the dance studio to be that third place for them. You want it to be the place where they have their real friends, where they have their real relationships, where they find their real worth and value. So we're really intentional about the community side. So I've already talked about the you matter, every kid matters, every class, every time. Then we talked about creating community. And then the next step for our retention, um, you know, our intention for retention is all about creating dance pathways. We actually have a program called Dance Pathways. And it's uh, our kind of trademark piece that um, really helps to put kids visioning themselves what they're doing with dance in the future. So there's two pieces to that. One is parent-teacher conferences regarding the actual dance part of what they do. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a part of that because I only teach uh, one class a week. I teach ballet seven. So if they've got to ballet seven, we're not worried about passing them up to the next level. (laughs) Um, But, you know, for that jazz one student, they could come in just like a school. And have a conference about their progress. You know, is there, are their skills developing, emerging? Are they towards mastery? Can they expect to move up? That does a lot for retention when you can help them to see the steps they need to take for success. Mm. Then I do a specific conference called the Dance Pathway Conference where I meet with a parent and a child for 20 minutes. And I really spell out for them what all the opportunities um, around dance 
what those opportunities are as they move into middle high school, college career and beyond. And I'll tell you, Clint, these are the most valuable conversations I'll have all year. I recently finished four full days, so four pretty much eight-hour days having these back-to-back conversations. But it's so eye-opening because I'm, I'm, for the first time for some of these kids, able to paint a picture that it's not just about the dance. I mean, that's the whole name of my business, more than just great dancing. I'm, I'm happy when we get kids into the Alvin Ailey Summer Program or into the you know, top universities for dance, but it's truly not about that. It's about using the vehicle of dance to create student leaders and life skills that will get kids college career and life ready. And when you have a chance to have that conversation with parents, um, it creates a completely different relationship between me as a studio owner and um, them as a uh, member of our studio. Now we're really playing the role of um, not selling dance classes, but preparing kids for life. And that really, uh, those three things queued up one after another have really been our secret to a very, very high retention rate and a very long uh, lifetime value student. Oh, it's, it's, it's brilliant. And the one thing that I love, I really love about it is it's, it's authentic. It's, it's still uh, strategic, but it's, it's very much attached to the values and the, and the culture that you want to build inside of your business. And I think that that's one thing that, that studio owners that are listening, you know, if you go in and go, right, okay, everyone write a letter. You know, Missy had a great idea. Everyone, all our teachers, go and write a letter. I mean, it's it's a great idea. And but you know, the great thing that Missy's talking about is they've done the work around around the values. They've got the right people in the organization. You know mm-hmm. where you want to head. You know where you want to take the student, the, the journey that you want to take them on. So these things that you're doing supports that vision, right? Absolutely. And if I could just put it in a nutshell, it, it's really not, I'm, I'm such a strategy person, not a tactic person. So mm-hmm. it, could, it could be write a letter. It could be make a cookie. <laughs> it, 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 the tactic yeah. doesn't matter. But the idea is to retain students, you have to personalize the experience in some way, shape or form. You mm-hmm. have to create a sense of community so that they want to belong. At, at our studio, we say everybody wears the team jacket, even if they're not on the team because they're on the Misty's Dance Unlimited team. Even if you're not on the competitive team, Yep. You're, you're part of our team. You're part of our family. Mm. And that create a sense of where they can go with this. So really just personalize the experience in some way, build community around the experience and show them where they can go with it. That really is um, my entire retention strategy in a nutshell. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing so openly. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Um, I want to, as we kind of wrap up, I want to ask you about, you know, as, as studio owners are listening and, and have heard your story and you've inspired them and, and motivate them and motivated them, you know, what are, what are some of the things that they can take into their studio to make sure that, you know, they're, they're, you know, 1231, you know, when they're filling out that scorecard at the end of the year is, you know, the numbers that they want to see, uh, the systems in place that they want to see, you know, what, what are going to be the key ingredients to make that a reality? Well, the first one you're probably going to think is uh, not the answer you're expecting, but the first one is to take care of yourself because uh, we recently did a survey. Actually, we did a, a three-year survey of our membership and asked them about how they felt about these eight different areas of their business life. And one was, you know, their personal health and relationships. And when compared to uh, the other things we typically measure, like your, your profit, your sense of success inside of your business, um, achievement, the health side always came in pretty low. So uh, I'm sure you were asking about uh, specifically systems, but I would say none of that matters if you don't have a, a good balance in your personal life, you're taking care of yourself, you wake up in the morning energized, you feel ready to start the day, you're excited about your work, you know, you, you could have the best systems possible. But if, if, if you open the door with burnout, mm-hmm. um, eventually that's going to be felt by the students, the teachers, um, you know, you can only go as high as the leader is, right? Yeah, exactly. I always say, you know, if you don't work, nothing does. 
Absolutely. So I would say to, you know, just to take a moment to reflect as you move into the busiest part of your season and the natural reset we have coming up here in the States where we're moving into recital and you get to set a new vision for yourself for this next school year. I mean, you can change anything at this point. I want studio owners to feel empowered that you don't have to do what always has been done. You know, if you want to try a new program or if you know you need to rework your tuition because it's not working or the schedule isn't working, this is this is your chance. So make sure you feel solid and then make sure you're making decisions now. Don't shortcut those decisions. We have a phrase inside membership that says, don't take $3,000 shortcuts that create $30,000 problems. You know, like <laughs> because you're tired and you're like, oh, just put me on that class for the schedule. I, I did that one year. I was so tired. It was after recital. We were making the schedule and it said, Oh, there's a class at eight, and I was pregnant at the time. Oh, there's a class at I'm on a Thursday night for 45 minutes, and we didn't even have room at the studio. We were doing it offsite in some health health club. Oh, I'll teach that. Just put my name on because we have to print the schedule. Well, you know, me taking a three hour shortcut, it would have taken me three hours to really solve that problem. It cost me 30 weeks of headache being pregnant. And- <laughs> Showing up, you know, leaving the house at 8.30 p.m. It was just oh my a, goodness. a challenge. So I, I want to encourage people, really dial in, take a self-assessment. You know, are you feeling good about yourself and the business, your personal health, and how you're balancing this with your family? Do you need to make dynamic changes? Uh, now is the time, especially in the States with that natural reset. And yeah. then kind of speaking to the system side of thing, you want to automate Everything, um, automate the low hanging fruit and personalize the really important things. Um, you know, for example, automate that free trial class. There's no reason you should be personally emailing back and forth somebody to get a, a free trial. There's tools for that. So automate that, those um, low uh, barrier to engagement and then personalize the, the high impact pieces. I think, yeah, when it comes to personalizing those kind of high impact pieces, it's what you were talking about, you know, the, the, the cards, the tactical stuff that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, and so tell me a little bit, have you got one more for us? Yeah, you bet. Well, I, Clint, I've got whole babes of things for you today. How long do we have? <laughs> well, I've got another minute. Okay. Um, I I would also encourage people to get their teams on board. I think it's a a common, and by teams, I mean your your leadership team, your teachers. I think it's really common for entrepreneurs to, you know, we enroll in a class or a mastery program, or we go to the conference and, and we come home and we're wired and fired. We're ready for change. We're going to set these systems in place. And our team hasn't heard that. They're not, they don't know what we're talking about. And, you know, they, they can kind of be ducking for cover when we come back from, you know, the inner circle or the studio owner university. So it's really important to take time to get the people around you bought in on the reason why you're doing things. Otherwise, all of these initiatives can just feel like you're just forcing them to do something else. Like, hey, here's a task list. You need to write a card to every <laughs> student. You know, here's what I need you to do. You need to do this, this extra thing. And um, that's not going to produce the result that you want. So I think having integrity through, you know, whatever is important for you at a strategy level or um, a campaign level for your studio this year, mm. and then how that plays out in for in, in terms of tactics, you know, what, how you actually execute on that, mm-hmm. you have to get buy-in from the people around you. Um, or that's never going to work. hundred percent. You know, I always say like enroll your people in your vision. You know, yes. it's so important that, you know, we're enrolling students into our, our, our studio. We've got to make sure that our, our team are, are really clear around that. And the other thing is, you know, for them to know, the why and the impact, like you said, go and write a letter. They're like, I don't want to write a letter. You right. write a letter. You right. Know? But, but you, ha- you, 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 again, you haven't kind of explained the, the whole picture and the impact. And now, you know, that you're doing that, you can tell them the story of the child sleeping with the, you know, sleeping with the letter and, and it, yes. it takes on a whole new life. That's right where it's at. Thank you. I'm glad I asked for one more. <laughs> That was gold. Hey, Misty, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad we we finally got to do um, this podcast interview. You bet. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to talk with your audience. And I just want to say that I always appreciate your generous spirit. It's it's, uh, pretty unusual in a pretty competitive industry to be able to uh, share openly like this. And I, I hope that our interaction encourages studio owners where they live and work to do the same thing. Uh, with the people in their area. 
Mm. Completely, completely agree with you. And Misty, where can our studio owners go to get more information about your studio and also more than just great dancing? You bet. You can check out our studio at mistysdance.com and our dance school association program is more than just great dancing.com. And I'd love to chat with you on either platform. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks again, Misty. And um, look forward to chatting with you again. Thanks, Clit. Take care. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Now, before I let you go, I just wanted to remind you again about our free guide, Nine Simple Secrets to Creating the Perfect Studio Handbooks that Save You Hours. Now, all you need to do is text the word handbook guide to 44222. That's text the word handbook guide to 44222. And you'll receive the guide straight away. Now, if you're outside of the US, just go to our website, dancestudioownersassociation.com forward slash free guide. That's dancestudioownersassociation.com forward slash free guide. And we'll shoot that guide across to you in your inbox within minutes. Really, this guide is going to change the way that you communicate inside of your studio, saving you so many hours a week asking, asking those repetitive questions. Okay, have a great day and I'll see you next week for the podcast. Bye for now. Thank you for joining us today. For all the resource links from the show and to receive access to our free dance studio growth training, make sure you visit transformmydancestudio.com.